So a compound is composed of two or more elements. How do we represent the compound? We do that with a chemical formula. In a chemical formula, we want to indicate what elements compose that um, compound and the relative numbers of each of them. So we do this um, by listing the chemical symbols for the elements and using subscripts to represent how many atoms of that element there are. So the chemical formula for water is H2O. So we've got H, the symbol for hydrogen, and O, the symbol for oxygen. After the hydrogen, we've got a subscripted number 2. That means there are two hydrogen atoms. After the oxygen, well, it's the end of a sentence, so there's a period, but there's no number after the oxygen. So we assume that that means 1. Because if it was 2 or 3 or 4, we'd write those numbers. If there was no oxygen, we wouldn't write the symbol. Uh, chemists tend to just not write the number 1 unless we have to. So instead of H2O1, we just write H2O. Carbon tetrachloride is represented this way. This is C, Cl4. Um, I chose the font on these slides because it does distinguish between a number 1, a capital I, and a lowercase l. It's subtle, but it is different. Um, when you're writing it out by hand, you want to be careful because you don't want this to look like carbon, carbon, and four iodines, right? Because capital I is the symbol for an element. But the fact that there would be two carbons in a row there should make you think, that's weird. Why not do C2I4? And that's what we would do. So this is CCl4. So I'll show you how I write those different letters in the number. So this is the number 1. A capital I has those, um, are those serifs? I'm not sure. Anyway, it's got the bars on the top and the bottom. And then for a lowercase l, I, I usually make my lowercase l's as a script l just to make sure that this is different, right? So I would, writing this by hand, I would write it like this to be clear about what I'm talking about. So there are some things in chemistry, actually quite a few things in chemistry and in science in general, where it has to be exactly right. And I know some students have a problem with that. They're like, but I was close. I, I knew what I meant. I was close. I just you know, didn't quite write it exactly. Well, the thing is, in life, there's a lot of situations where it has to be exactly correct. So you're sending an email to your boss explaining why you're going to miss the big meeting. And you type one letter in the address wrong. Maybe he's got the number one in the address, and you thought it was a capital I. Is he going to get the email? No. That one letter difference has a big effect. So there are some things where we do have to be exactly correct. And, and part of the trick to just getting through life is understanding when does it have to be exactly correct, and when can it just be good enough. So like when you're spelling element names, if you spell chromium without the H, I'm going to understand what you mean. But when you're writing element symbols in a compound, if you leave the R off the chromium symbol, I'm going to assume you mean carbon because that's what you wrote. Capital C is carbon. Okay. There are different types of chemical formulas. <coughs> um, empirical formulas, molecular formulas, and structural formulas. This word empirical means um, that it's, it comes from experimentation. So the empirical formula gives us the relative numbers of atoms. So as an example, we can look at hydrogen peroxide. So the molecular formula for hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. One molecule of, of hydrogen peroxide contains two hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms. It's similar to oxygen, but has very different properties. The empirical formula gives us the lowest ratio of hydrogens to oxygens. So the lowest ratio would be one hydrogen to one oxygen. You can think of these subscripts as being like ratios 
or like fractions. A ratio of 2 to 2 oops, can be simplified to 1 to 1. Or if you're thinking in terms of fractions, 2 over 2 is, means the same thing as 1 over 1. So this is the empirical formula gives the relative numbers the lowest ratio, the smallest ratio. Why don't we write all of them like this? Well, there are often different compounds that have the same empirical formula. This is the molecular formula. That tells us exactly how many atoms are in a molecule. So the molecular formula is giving us the actual numbers of atoms in a molecule. So for this compound, C4H8, that's the molecular formula, but we could write the empirical formula for this by simplifying this ratio of 4 to 8. We can divide both of those numbers by 4 and get a ratio of 1 to 2. CH2 is the empirical formula. This is the molecular formula. Here's another compound, B2H6. That ratio, 2 to 6, can be simplified to BH3. This is the lowest ratio, the empirical formula. For something like carbon tetrachloride that we looked at, CCL4, that ratio of 1 to 4 can't be simplified any further. In this case, the empirical formula and the molecular formula are exactly the same. And there are a lot of compounds that are that way, where the molecular formula and the empirical formula are the same. Question? So, can the empirical formula actually exist, or does it always combine as? A That's an excellent question. So, could this empirical formula exist as a compound? Could this be the molecular formula for a compound? Well, this particular one can't, but I wouldn't expect you to know that. Um, empirical formulas can be molecular formulas. And so this is, um, this is an example of that because this is an empirical formula and it's also the molecular formula of a compound. Um, you, you don't always know when you look at a formula like this where the ratio is the smallest. You don't know for sure is that also the molecular formula or not. You need more information. If we look at these formulas, we should assume that those are molecular formulas because they are not empirical formulas. You can look at this ratio and see that it could be simplified. That tells me these are not empirical formulas. So I would assume that they are molecular formulas. Any questions about that? And then we have structural formulas. Those give us more information. They actually tell us how the atoms are connected to each other. And these are usually written for molecular compounds. Um, and so the covalent bonds are represented using lines. And it shows how the different atoms are connected. We'll learn that there are single, double, and triple bonds. And so we represent those, a single line for a single bond, a double line for a double bond, triple line for a triple bond. Which formula we use depends on the situation. Um, it depends on how much we know about the compound and how much we want to communicate about the compound. A structural formula is going to give the most information, um, but especially when you're dealing with a computer, either a Word document or PowerPoint or something, it can be very tedious to get that formula, structural formula, into the computer because it basically involves drawing. Um, an empirical formula is going to communicate the least amount Molecular formulas are kind of in between. I'd say molecular formulas are kind of the regular sort of formula, but they're all useful in their own situations. Any questions? <coughs> <coughs> so this is something that you should be able to do. Um, write the empirical formulas for the compounds represented by these different molecular formulas. So they're telling us these are the molecular formulas. What are the empirical formulas? So how do we approach this? We're looking at the subscripts. We're looking at the, we've got 5 to 12. Can that be simplified? No, 
The subscripts have to be whole numbers, so we can't go to, you know, two and a half to six. That's, that's not good. So since that can't be simplified, the empirical formula is the same as the molecular formula because it's already in its simplest form. How about this one? Hg2Cl2. Can that be simplified? Yeah. 2 to 2 is the same as 1 to 1. So we can write that as HgCl. Okay. When we're looking at formulas, this is where the fact that chemical symbols always start with a capital and the second letter, if there is one, is not capitalized. So when we see HG, we know that those go together. That's just one element. And here we've got CL. That's a second element. How about this one, C2H402? CH2O. So we can take all of those subscripts, 2, 4, and 2, and divide them by 2 and end up with 1, 2, and 1. Any questions? We also have models. So those are structures or formulas. I mean, <coughs> we also have models. And models are more accurate, um, but they're even harder to represent on a, a screen. Um, so these are most useful um, in a, like a model kit where you can actually build these things and look at them. Models are helpful because they give us a better visual picture of what the atom looks like. Ball and stick models are very pop, uh, common. Um, here the atoms are represented as balls and the bonds are represented as sticks. And how we connect the balls and the sticks gives us an idea of the shape of the molecule. Typically, the, the balls are color-coded for specific elements. Um, these are not always used, but they are typically used. And uh, you do not need to memorize these colors and elements, but you'll see that the book uses them pretty consistently. Every time we see an illustration of a water molecule, it's one larger red circle and two smaller white circles. The white represents hydrogen, the red represents oxygen. And so using the same color every time helps us because we don't have to label all the atoms with their symbols. Any questions? So this is an example of a ball and stick model. Um, here's a molecular formula. Here's the structural formula. It shows how the carbons and hydrogens are connected to each other. All the hydrogens are connected to the carbon, which is in the middle. Without knowing any more chemistry than what I've told you so far, you could imagine several different ways to stick four hydrogens and one carbon together. <coughs> this is the correct way, um, the only way you can do it, and we'll learn why later. So there's the ball and stick. The black ball represents the carbon, and the white ones are hydrogen. This is a space-filling model. This is going to give a more accurate um, picture of, of how the molecule might appear if it was visible, right? They're not visible, but if, if we scaled it to visible size, this is more like what it would look like. So the space filling model is, is useful in some situations. Uh, we tend to stick with the ball and stick model a lot because we can see very clearly all the atoms. When you get a large thing um, in the space filling model, there are sometimes atoms on the back of it that you can't see unless you actually have the physical model in your hand. So this table from your textbook shows um, the different formulas and the different models for a few different compounds. So here's glucose. That's um, sugar, the sugar that's in your blood, so sometimes called blood sugar. Um, this is the molecular formula. A molecule of glucose has six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. The empirical formula, though, is CH2O. Turns out there are a lot of molecules that have this same empirical formula. And there are actually a lot of compounds that have the same molecular formula. The structural formula tells us how these are connected. And for sugars, there are two kinds of glucose, and then there are a series of other hexoses. They've got six 
six carbons in them. And the differences are very subtle in terms of where these OH groups are and how they're oriented in space, where this C double bond O is. And they make different compounds, even though they're composed of exactly the same number of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. So this shows us how they're connected. This is the ball and stick model. And this is the space filling model. So if you only had the space filling model, you and we're trying to write the formula from that, you might miss some of those atoms that are hiding on the back side of it. But this gives us a, a better indication of the actual shape. Any questions?